All right, I think we're gonna keep going for a second presentation. Remotely being zoomed in, please welcome Peter Pekarczyk. That's gonna talk about Reason versus TypeScript. Peter. Hey, everybody. All right, excellent. Cool. Uh, so I'm really on a bunch of DayQuil and coffee right now. The reason I couldn't make it is I, I could be the first case in Illinois that has Corona. So we'll see. It'll, oh. it'll, be, it'll be cool to be famous for something. Uh, but anyway, so here I am uh, zooming in. Um, I'm trying something new, right? So since I'm not there, I kind of put together this Notion doc that kind of outlines my presentation. And I'll try to be as interactive. And maybe, maybe it'll be great. And maybe it'll suck. But like I said, DayQuil, you know, gives you a lot of great ideas. So uh, here we go. Anyway, uh, my name is Peter Pikarchik. Uh Pies, cars, and chicks is a great way to remember that. I'm the co-founder and CTO of DraftBit. Uh, I created Apollo query components. If you ever use Apollo, uh, and you know, like you use the query component and stuff. Uh, I, I created that and then briefly became a maintainer of Apollo. Uh, I'm Expo's first user. If you're familiar with React Native uh, and help build that community through just contributions and uh, React Native Radio, et cetera. Uh, I went through Y Combinator a couple of years ago, which was an interesting experience. Uh, and obviously I love Reason, uh, which is one thing I'll be talking about today. Uh, this is my Twitter. I, I've updated my alias to be this golden doodle for a while just to see how uh, it would go actually not too well ever since I said I was at a I was a golden doodle I lost like 20 followers overnight so maybe maybe I'll switch back but anyway uh, let's let's begin so um, if you haven't heard of draftbit uh, draftbit is a tool that helps teams build mobile apps visually right from the browser all you do is go to a website you can scan a QR code you can use the uh, preview directly on your phone or you can do it right in the browser like as you see here this is me just messing around um, all this is interactive too right because what we're doing is we are running a web version of the app in this preview and then when you scan uh, this QR code you get to run the live version of the app so it's pretty cool uh, the apps that people are building are pretty neat uh, they're you know as complex as you want them to be uh, we are publishing PWA soon directly from Traffic, which will be cool. And then the code that we export is, you know, production grade. It's really nice. Even this, like Peter Jeffrey stuff, as you can see, right? Like if you're familiar with React Native, uh, we strive to do a very good job of that. Um, anyway, so, oh yeah, just a little GIF here that shows off me being able to click things from a different app. Uh, so a little bit about DraftBit and our stack. I think that'll make this uh, talk a little more beneficial. So on our API, we use TypeScript, Apollo Server, uh, Nexus GraphQL, and uh, TypeORM, right? All TypeScript stuff. People always come at me saying I'm biased, that I don't use TypeScript, so I don't understand why it's so great. But, you know, we, we do use it too. And, you know, I'll have to disagree with you. Uh, it's not as great as you, you think, which is fine. Because uh, on the client, we use Reason, Apollo, GenType, and Tailwind CSS, right? So we're a startup, and this is sort of our journey, right? Uh, we used to live in San Francisco. Our living room was, was our office, right? We lived in this, like, piece of shit, $3.5 million house that's a mansion now. They, like, knocked it down and built this, like, mega house. And we lived down the street from Perry, uh, Donkey from Shrek, which is pretty cool. Um, those are the cool parts of the startups, right? But startups are hard, right? You need to be better, faster uh, than your competitors. You've got fewer resources. So you have to choose the right tools for the job, right? And sometimes that means tools that you know, and sometimes tools that you're experimenting with, right? And we, if there's one thing that you do at startups is that you, you, know, you sure do work a lot, right? Um, there's plenty of opinions, right? There's, there's not too many people, too, too few people. Uh, low salaries compared to the corporate life. Uh, but, you know, the best parts about working at a startup is the, the fantastically challenging problems that you're excited about solving 
every day, right? If there's any reason to work at a startup, it's probably because you're like one of 10 people and you make a difference, right? Every person makes a difference, right? So I wasn't thinking when I made this next section because I can't see anybody, uh, but I imagine that there are folks in the crowd that have uh, heard of TypeScript and there are probably folks that use TypeScript too, which is great. Uh, TypeScript is cool, right? So what is TypeScript? Uh, we've only heard about it in the last couple of years, but believe it or not, it was released in 2012. Uh, 2012 was when TypeScript first came out at Microsoft and you know things have changed but the but the fundamental principles are the same right it's just a superset of JavaScript that you know that offers optional static typing to the language it didn't get much attention though back then when you were using uh, TypeScript you probably weren't right because it was used using this thing called CodePlex, which I don't think anybody, anybody in this room has heard of. Maybe you have. Can't see your facial expressions, so I can't gauge. Uh, but the project was moved to GitHub. And then back then, it offered a new compiler that offered five times the performance. Man, so if you were using 24, TypeScript in 2014 or before that, I can't imagine how slow it must have been. Uh, in 2016, TypeScript 2.0 came out, right? That's when the hype really started uh, to like you know make an impact. A lot of uh, frameworks and library authors were starting to look at it, right? Uh, because it included this awesome option that prevented variables from being assigned to null values, right? The billion dollar mistake. Uh, the billion dollar mistake is, uh, you know, the invention of null, right? So 1965, it was created by this uh, person who, you know, was building this comprehensive type system uh, and, you know, wanted things to be absolutely sh safe but it was too easy uh, to add null, so he did, right? So that's led to, you know, you know what he calls the billion dollar mistake. Uh, it's caused a billion dollars of pain and damage in the last 40 years, probably even more than that. So as we know, TypeScript is still actively maintained and promoted by Microsoft. They've got a team of over 50 people. I think they spend, you know, about $30 million on marketing, uh, so on and so forth, right? So why did Microsoft create TypeScript? Right, you must wonder, right? We all know Microsoft as this big company, uh, you know, like never was into open source, never really cared about any of the things that we were doing on the web, right? It was always C sharp, right? Well, you got to give it to Microsoft for, you know, like moving along with the trends, right? They're very good about staying current. And so, as you, we've all seen in the last couple of years, they've totally changed their, <coughs> their, you know, like, their opinions about open source, right? They bought GitHub, right? They made Visual Studio Code an open source editor, right? They're giving us TypeScript for free. Who would have thought, right? Um, this is coming from the company that was charging thousands of dollars for Visual Studio and C Sharp and .NET, right? Uh, so why did Microsoft create TypeScript, right? Because it was trying to uh, attract talent and business, right? They have this huge pool of C Sharp developers, right? folks writing .NET, web stuff, and knew that slowly the web would take over the world, right? So they needed to create something that was similar to C Sharp, right? Uh, that compiles to JavaScript and make it easy, they can make it an easy transition, right? Like you, you love the integrated experience of C Sharp and the Visual Studio. How can we bring that to, you know, JavaScript, right? And that's where uh, Visual Studio and TypeScript sort of came about. Right, open sourcing and promoting TypeScript also meant more libraries. Uh, right, more libraries written in this language. Right, developers would learn this language. Right, uh, Visual Studio is the editor of choice. Right, now you've created this great developer experience. Right, and what this sort of leads to is developers trying out Azure. Right, Microsoft's web hosting company. Right, so it's sort of uh, Microsoft is smart in this sense because you know they do all these things to just get you to pay for their services. Right. Um, anyway, uh, Reason. So unlike TypeScript, I'm sure many of you may not have heard of Reason, right? Um, and you've probably not used Reason, right? Maybe you've heard of it, you've been skeptical, you've already been burned by JavaScript, you've been burned by TypeScript, right? Why would I give Reason a shot, right? Reason's got a different story, right? Different people, different dynamics, right? Different culture. Uh, so Reason was created by Jordan Walk. Uh, the same person who created React.js, right? 
he took the main themes of React, you know, immutability, declarative style, you know, uh, and applied it at the language level, right? Which pairs very nicely with React JS, right? Believe it or not, Jordan first wrote React in standard ML in 2010 at Facebook because of how expressive uh, the language is and how easy it is to express HTML. Uh, you think about 2010, that's insane, right? 2010, uh, you know, I think that was like, a, like three years after you were, like CSS hovers were created, right? Like before you'd have to, you'd copy the snippet from SourceForge and then, you know, like your CSS hover would work, right? Uh, this was before Babel, Flow, any sort of type systems talk, right? Pretty or even NPM, right? Like 2010, we had like IE6, right? Or eight, maybe, maybe eight was like coming out, right? So it was a different world, right? You'd spend a lot of time debugging things and trying to make it work across different browsers. Uh, so it was a hard sell to get Facebook's developers to use when everything was still server rendered markup via PHP, right? So then ultimately uh, they decided to rewrite uh, React uh, to JavaScript and then release it to the public in 2013, right? And now we know how that's played out, right? One of the most popular frameworks in the world, right? Uh, it's insane. Um, anyway, so after several years of dealing with the frustration of how do I handle my data layer? How do I do this? How do I do that? Right? Like, you know, 2010, we didn't have anything, but by like 2015, 2016, we had uh, immutable JS. We had flux. We went through this stage where we had alt and redux and McFly and all these different ways of doing uh, data. Right. And nobody really understand what unidirectional data flow meant. Right. And we all decided that redux was the best way, except nobody really liked redux. Uh, we just had no better way to do it, right? And now even the creators of Redux are saying don't use it. Um, you know, we got, you know, Babel, we got Pretty, or we got all these different things. Uh, you know, we got like three different ESLint uh, packages that are really popular. And how do you get Airbnb ESLint to work with Prettier or, or Standard and Prettier to work, right? Like all these different things, right? So uh, Jordan decided to revisit that React story, and that's how Reason was born. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of great things that uh, Reason offers, right? The functional programming, the immutable data structures, right? Like transpiling, compiling, type checking. In 2010, none of those words meant anything to people, right? It's like, I just, you know, I just, let me run my HTML and CSS and my JavaScript and just let me be, right? But then, you know, six or seven years later, that actually means something. And the reason is this JavaScript-like syntax built on top of OCaml. Right, and it uses its YoCamel's AST under the hood, uh, and uses BuckleScript to output uh, human-readable, really, really fast code. Right, uh, the big sales pitch for Reason was being able to utilize the language to do things that you know we've had numerous packages for already. Right, uh, thanks to like the expressive nature and the pattern matching, we get things like React Router built in right away. Right. Reason's also a first-class citizen when it comes to React, and I'll tell you about that. So everything that React does, uh, Reason does too, right? So, so why did Facebook create Reason, right? So, you know, sort of giving you the background, right? So Facebook already had the super extensive infrastructure built in OCaml, right? Uh, Hack, right, which is their version of PHP, uh, and FlowType, which is a JavaScript stack type checker, which, you know, no longer really has much footing in the outside world, but is still, you know, uh, very popular at Facebook internally and, you know, runs on millions of lines in code and scales well. It's actually a shame that flow type did it end up uh, winning because it, it arguably is a more powerful type checker, but that's a story for another day. Uh, OCaml is fast, uh, it's stable, and type safe without getting in the way. Um, and like, unlike Microsoft's external uh, initiatives, right, which is trying to get every, everybody, you know, to use uh, a type checker, right, just like sp spread across whatever, Facebook purpose-built reason to handle the scale of super massive applications, both in terms of users and code bases, right? Facebook uses a mono repo internally, right, with thousands upon thousands of commits take place every day. Right, and they've got uh, 70,000 React components right now, right? So it's huge, right? 
And messenger.com is, re is uh, the current success story, right? So facebook.com, uh, still primarily React.js, but messenger.com is all 100% reason. And the biggest part of that is the amount of bug reports that take place on a week to week basis used to be 10 bugs week to week. Now it's about 10 bugs a quarter, right? Reason's marketing budget, unlike you know, Microsoft's like mega $30 million budget, is also $0, right? Like Facebook does not spend any marketing dollars on Reason. Um, and that's, that's on purpose. Right, so what is OCaml, right? Why did, why did Jordan decide to use OCaml under the hood, right? So if you've got a computer science degree, uh, chances are it's a language that you hope you'd never see again, right? Unless you work somewhere that relies on like code that, you know, like where money is involved, hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Lots of financial institutions use OCaml, right? Lots of infrastructure projects use OCaml, right? Uh, it's, like a, it's like a behind the scenes, right? Built by very smart, academic uh, individuals, right? It's got things like agile, algebraic data types. I don't even know what that is. Uh, pattern matching is awesome. The memory management is great. And uh, one of the most beautiful things about OCaml is being able to separate the language from uh, the compiler from the application, right? So uh, there is OCaml that compiles to JavaScript. There's OCaml that compiles to bytecode. Right, there's OCaml that compiles, you know, your uh, server app to a bare metal project, right? Which is pretty cool, right? And it was it was invented by, you know, a team of French uh, researchers in 1996, and it, you know, it built it. It was this whole thing to uh, provide a type system without getting in the way, right? And I'll show you what I mean by that soon, right? So with TypeScript, you have to type everything explicitly. With Reason and OCaml, you don't, right? Uh, the type checker does a very good job of inferring that, right? So your code is always 100% type safe and sound, right? The whole, like, if it compiles, it runs, uh, you know, applies to reason very well, right? So what's BuckleScript? So BuckleScript is the thing that actually converts your reason or OCaml to human-readable JavaScript, right? And I'll show you what that looks like. And the JavaScript that it compiles, not only, you know, it's not like mangled, right? It's not like opening up a file after running TSC build, right? It's, it's readable, right? It's indented. Uh, you know, it's got real variable names. And its purpose is to, for you to be able to um, debug issues easily, right? You can see exactly what's going on. Um, so BuckleScript allows you to use the best of both worlds, right? This industrial strength, super powerful language that's been around for years that has some of the best type theory um, available, the best type theory available, uh, but with uh, an ecosystem and packages that you are so familiar with, right? You can use Yarn, Webpack, Minifiers. You can use React Router. You can use uh, Express. You could use any package on the NPM ecosystem directly in your Reason project. Um, and it uh, was created by Hang Bo Zhang at Bloomberg, right? Bloomberg is a New York financial institution, um, and it was adopted as like the primary JavaScript compiler for Reason. There's a couple of them, right? Uh, but you know, folks in the Reason world really like uh, BuckleScript because, like I said, it's readable, it's fast, and it's great. Um, and one of the selling points too is like you know a 10% gain on for compilers much, but uh, BuckleScript compiles much faster than TypeScript. It's, a, it's about uh, 10 times faster. Um, if you've got 1,000 TypeScript files and 1,000 Reason files, um, your Reason project will compile in a matter of seconds, right? Three or four seconds, whereas uh, your TypeScript may take much longer. Um, and there's two different type systems involved here, right? Two different choices were made, right? So TypeScript's got this post hoc type system, right? And it's trying to fit a type system onto a language that's already been developed, right? Um, it's turning complete, you know, if that, you know, which is kind of cool, right? Um, it means you can create programs with the type system, but it also means that the type system is error prone, right? Um, and one of the selling points of TypeScript is being able to gradually apply types to a file, right? It doesn't do any optimizations, doesn't do any validations, right? And you must explicitly deal with things, right? Things like any even null and undefined, right? So it's still JavaScript, right, with a little bit of type safety, right? Uh, Reason, on the other hand, uses the Hindley Miller type system, right? So that's that's the you know that's the type system that was invented, you know, 
uh, 40 years ago, right? It's gone through several iterations, right? It's very powerful. It's used for things like lambda calculus, I don't know anything about it, and parametric polymorphism, right? It's the type system that you see in every functional programming language for the most part, things like Haskell, you know, OCaml standard ML, right? And the beauty of it is the type can be inferred without requiring any declarations right or annotations by the programmer, right? So you don't have to type anything and it'll be automatically inferred, right? Uh, the code in these situations is very type safe, right? It's 100% type safe. Um, you must get the type right or like, it, it'll infer the type immediately and it'll always be there, right? And your code is sound for that reason too, right? Uh, it's not like, you know, incrementally applying the type inside of a JavaScript file, right? This function's got types and this function's doesn't, right? Everything in reason is always 100% typed. Um, so a draft day, why did we choose reason on the client, right? Reason is pretty new, right? OCaml has been around for, you know, uh oh, Bill, I think you connected and now there's an Yeah, episode. yeah, hang on. Everybody wants to join the Zoom. I guess I'll keep going because the echo is gone. Uh, so, you know, reason is new, right? Like it does not have the reach that TypeScript does, right? If there's anything that uh, Microsoft's done well is hype up TypeScript, right? Um, argue, you know, like, not as powerful as a tool, right? But everybody's using it, right? Reason, on the other hand, is a very powerful tool and it will make you a better JavaScript developer, but not many people are using it, right? There's no marketing dollars spent. It's a product that's being focused on the developer experience first, right? So as a startup, that's a big risk, right? It's a big risk. Well, uh, for us, you know, like uh, we, the bet we took was, you know, Jordan is a really smart person. Um, and we decided to give it a shot, right? He created React. So if he's saying, hey, check out this thing that fixes a lot of the issues, it's sort of worth looking into. And it's a, it's a risk I'm glad that we took, right? Um, you could argue that Reason is just a better version of JavaScript, but it's, it's much more than that, right? It's not, it's not JavaScript with a type checker. It's not lipstick on a pig. It's a, it's a completely different uh, language, right? Like everything is immutable from the very beginning, right? Everything is fast everything, you know, is a pure function for the most part, right? So you can follow along code very, very easily, right? And you build up functions. Um, and then your, your program, like whatever, you know, React components that you write or functions that you write, right? It's just a composition of all this stuff put together, right? Uh, once your reason code compiles, it's guaranteed to work. No questions asked. No errors in productions. We never do. Uh, we actually don't even have to write that many tests, right? So, you know, we do have end-to-end -end tests, right? Like using Cypress and stuff. But, you know, when it comes to just and integration testing, uh, the, the, the system does a very good job of eliminating, you know, a whole class of errors, which makes our code pretty good. Uh, there is no such thing as null and undefined in reason. Uh, things are either something or nothing, right? Which is, which is one of the confusing parts at first, right? Which is something that folks struggle with. Uh, because in JavaScript, you can do whatever you want, right? So, if you get a request from the server, right, data could either be, uh, you know, null or an array, right? Like, uh, it's either something or nothing, and you handle those cases separately, right? Uh, because of the type system, it makes refactoring React components really easily. I could remove a prop from here, add a prop there, change the type of that prop, and Reason will tell me in every spot where that happens and it won't compile until I fix it, right? So that, that makes refactoring and updating code uh, makes us a lot more confident about it, right? And then Reason offers tree shaking like you've never seen before, right? Um, the other day I was tweeting about, can you imagine if somebody wrote a uh, webpack in Reason, right? 100% type safe, right? Being, out, being able to understand the entire structure of your application and being able to compile it, right? It would take seconds to compile, you know, like, you know, running yarn build and create React app or view or whatever, right? Like, that takes, you know, 30, 40 seconds, minutes sometimes, right? Minutes usually. Uh, it would literally take five or 10 seconds for something like Webpack to be written in Reason. It's radical. Um, you know, so there's a lot of improvements over JavaScript. So the bad parts of Reason, right? I talk all it up, but, you know, truly the bad parts of Reason are the documentation, right? And the, you know, the lack of use compared to TypeScript, right? Documentation has been a work in progress, especially for beginners, right? The learning curve is pretty hard, right? 
Reason protects you from typical JavaScript mistakes, things that you're used to doing, and that's super frustrating, right? You're trying to accomplish something and the compiler keeps yelling at you. I don't blame you for not liking it, right? Uh, but those safeguards are what you know prevent your code from breaking in production. Um, okay, so that was just spiel about uh, you know reason on the client, right? So we chose uh, TypeScript on the server, right? So there is a you know we could have gone with uh, reason on the client or on the server too. Uh, there's this thing called reason native, and it's a very exciting thing, but it's a it's a work in progress still, right? So I've already put the company, you know. Uh, you know, the risk factor was already pretty high with using a reason on the client, right? So using a uh, reason on the server was just not something that, you know, not a risk that I was willing to take personally, right? Some of the cool things that you could do with reason native on the server, if you're interested in, is imagine uh, OKML is something called unikernels, right? So right now, if you want to run your app, right, no matter where you're, if you're using Lambdas or Kubernetes or whatever, right, you've got this host, right, a Linux box running somewhere in the server, and that host has everything that, the application needs to run right your networking stack your firewall you know like all the different like the routing tables like everything that you need right imagine being able to take your application right which you know could compile to like one megabyte in the reason world and then just taking the firewall and tcp ip and then running them in bare metal right like uh, you've got a very fast uh uh server that does not use any resources right so if you're if you're using uh, reason at scale, which at which you know several very large companies are doing, it, the server costs are monumental, right? But given that we're a small team, it's just you know there's the there's still a lot of trailblazing to be done, and we just weren't willing to take that risk, right? So we went with TypeScript on the server, right? That's why I, I'm no longer biased, right? I can give you uh, objective uh, feedback on both sides, right? So Prisma GraphQL was this awesome library paired up with TypeORM that lets us put together a TypeSafe GraphQL server without changing languages, right? So we're, you know, we were already using JavaScript on the server, right? Not much safety. We were using Connect. We were writing raw SQL queries at times, right? The early days of draft, it was just like getting this shizzle out the door, right? So we're like, we need to improve this, right? We need some stability. So it's done a really good job, right? Um, but, you know, that also comes with, you know, uh, some consequences, right? The compiler and type checker are so slow. Uh, so folks that, you know, switch over from reason to TypeScript at work always complain about uh, why is this taking so long? What's going on, right? Like we, our reason code base is about seven times the size and it compiles seven times faster. Um, anytime you Google, you know, a TypeScript type issue, right? Just trying to figure out what's going on uh, usually get an answer like this isn't ideal, but you know uh, it works, right? So if you've got you know if some sort of library needs uh, an array of read-only strings, right, and you're passing in just strings, you gotta you gotta spread you know the array, create a new array just just to make the the compiler pass, right? You have to add extra logic to slow down your application to make the compiler pass, right? Which is a little funny, right? Um, it's not entirely type safe, right? You know, which is, I think, okay for the most part. I think if you're used to using real languages, you know, like depending on your background, right? It's a little scary, uh, but you know, at the same time, I think I think it's okay. Um, so Rich Harris, he actually just gave this presentation. Uh, he retweeted about this actually, eight, eight last year. Um, he started this whole thread, uh, you know, just like talking about like how we've been able to make JavaScript do certain things through the use of libraries, right? React isn't just a library, it's this compiler, right? Like it's a scheduler, it does so many crazy things, right? Uh, and things that we wouldn't be able to do with JavaScript, right? So we built tools around that, right? With a tool like Reason, uh, you get that out of the box. So uh, using them together, right? So one of the most exciting parts is being able to use Reason and TypeScript together, right? Like they work very well in harmony, right? Uh, so I, you know, I argue that Reason makes you a better JavaScript developer, right? Even if, even if, you know, people at work are like, no, 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 you can't use it or whatever, and you go home and use it, right? The concepts that you learn from a language like Reason will make you a better JavaScript developer, right? It'll make you a better TypeScript developer. I've seen it happen 
you know, a draft bid. I've seen it happen at other companies, right? Folks that apply reason, whether on their own or at work, become better at writing JavaScript. Um, and you can import TypeScript files into Reason, and you can import Reason files into TypeScript, right? Or JavaScript, or Flow, or whatever you want, right? The interop is built in to make that easier. Um, that's onto this tool called GenType. Uh, so, oh no wonder none of these. I was I, I was using the wrong browser. So anyway, GenType is this tool built by uh, this person named Cristiano. He sold this company called Infer to Facebook for hundreds of millions of dollars, and now his primary goal is to be able to generate the best TypeScript and flow types from Reason code, right? Uh, he does that by design, right? So flow type for internally on Facebook, uh, TypeScript for the rest of the world, right? So I'm gonna try to do some code examples now. Uh, so I need to know if this is A, readable and large enough. Can everyone, can everyone see this? Should, can I make it, should I make it bigger? Bigger, all right, cool, nice. Let me just do that real quick. All right, we're gonna go with, damn, I thought it was gonna be pretty big already. We'll go with 36, right? 36 is sick. All right, so, TMSRE, okay. What about this? This better, bigger? I can make it bigger, don't be shy. Oh, wow, exciting. All right, so let's see here. So we're gonna make it 48. This is really exciting. Better? Okay, cool, 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 awesome. So on this side, let me pull up what I have running here. Okay, cool. So. This, this on the left-hand side doesn't matter too much. I'm actually going to center this at first. We'll, we'll do a walkthrough of what's going on here. And if there's a lot, I'm going to try to do the best I can to break it up. So what I've done is I've generated a Create React App project with a TypeScript template, right? What I've also done is I've turned off the ability to use null, right? And uh, I think any too. Uh, but in any case, right? So everything that you see here is a TypeScript app, right? And we're doing some things here. So I'm importing this uh, file called greeting up here, right? So uh, you'll notice that greeting has this thing called gen at the end of it, right? You'll also notice this. This is weird, right? What we're doing here is we're importing reason components into you know, my JavaScript application, right? So what, what is happening? Uh, so we'll go over the BS one first, right? BS stands for buckle script, right? So uh, we're gonna open up um, the modal, right? And what this modal looks like is it's a React component, right? It uses hooks, right? This is all in Reason. Um, and you know when you when you click open modal, it toggles a modal, and then you can close that modal, right? So I know there's a lot on the screen right now. Uh, so I'm just going to show you real fast, right? The component that you see here on the right-hand side is this, right? Open modal, right? Close modal, right? We're using uh, hooks here, right? Visible toggle, right? Things are a little different. I'll go over those in a second, right? So what happens? Uh, Buckle script then compiles that automatically to this file called modalbs.js, right? So this without running prettier or without doing anything is what it uh what it generates right so what it's doing is it's importing react as you know it's importing props right it's using use state here right it's fetching those props right um it's got your button right so um you don't see jsx here right by design you're using what jsx uh compiles to which is react.create element right um, and it might seem like a lot. I know there's, like I said, I got a lot going on on the screen right now. Um, at least for me, this is like massive, right? Uh, but you know, react.create element button, right? On click, right? You've got your text here, right? Um, it's all very, very legible and easy, right? I think the differences uh, are, is that it does this var make equal modal thing, right? And then it exports make, right? So we go back to this main TypeScript or app.tsx file, 
what we're doing is we're importing make as modal, right? That's a little different than what you know, you're used to, right? Um, and that's because of the way that we name this component, right? Every component uh, uses make because that's what uh, OCaml wants you to do under the hood. And you may say, I don't like that, right? You could also do default exports the way that you're used to. So you just do let default is equal make at the bottom here, right? Now, if we open up that file, yes, I know. Right, so now you've got this extra stuff here. Default equals modal export, default as default, right? Because of the way that uh, JavaScript's, uh, you know, common JS system works, right? Uh, that's, what it, that's what it ultimately does. So we could do this. We could now import this as modal directly, right? And things will just continue to compile and work correctly, right? Uh, any questions so far? Should I ask questions now? I guess it's weird because I'm not there. So I can't see anybody's faces and I can't see if anybody's confused. I assume that people are confused. Uh, so I'm just going to keep talking and then we'll try to do questions uh, in a minute. I, I'm not too far off. OK. So now let's go over uh, something more powerful, right? So we built this modal, right? But this modal is not actually type checked, right? There's no type checking here, right? Um, that's where gen type comes in. So we have another component. Uh, and this component's got this thing called uh, this, this decorator, if you will, right? It says greeting, right? And you put this on top of it, right? And what that does is it generates a file called gen.tsx, right? And that includes the props, right, for TypeScript for that component, right, automatically, right? I type that component in TypeScript on my own, right? So as you can see here, the differences are very, very familiar, right? So, you know, import asterisk from React, you've got type props, right? I was actually wrong about this, right? Because this prop here, you know, is read only, right? So one could argue that I should have done this, right? But this is the TypeScript that I wrote by hand on the right-hand side. And this is what uh, BuckleScript and GenType generated on the other side, right? So, and then I can just import greeting directly uh, into the project and use it, right? And so you're wondering, why does this not use greeting or make, right? Why did, why did we not have to do this, right? Well, GenType just knows and understands uh, that folks prefer uh, this, this is something that they're more used to, right? Seeing this in your code base may be a little weird. So they just wrote, uh, you know, just, just wrapper to let you import things, uh, you know, directly like you're used to, right? So there's one thing that I realized that I totally neglected, and that's to break down what a reason component looks like and what it does, right? So I, you know, if I saw your faces, I would have known that from the beginning and reminded myself to get back on track, but here we are. So anyway, so this is, a, uh, this is a reason component, right? And a lot of the things that you see are the same, right? So you got span tags just like this, right? All the tags that you're used to are there, right? But there's differences too, right? For one, everything starts with make, right? Parameters are a little different, right? So in JavaScript, we do this, right? But in reason, we've got something called labeled arguments, and they just look like this, right? And this is our prop, right? The compiler can infer that this is a string, right? And then what we do here, this is, this is something that you haven't seen before either, is passing in uh, not just an empty string the way that you usually see it, but wrapping the code in react.string, right? Because everything in reason is type safe, right? Even the output, right, needs to be, right? So when you've got an array, when you've got a string, when you've got anything along these lines, you must, you must wrap it, right? And that offers the type safety of it can't be, it, you know, can't be null, right? If this was null, it would freak out. Uh, React.component, this decorator here, what it does is it just, it just writes a bunch of boilerplate behind the scenes that lets you, that lets this uh, turn into a React.js comment without any extra middle layer code. I don't necessarily know what exactly is going on with this decorator, but it's something that you include everywhere. Uh, the optional piece is this, right? This, this gen type uh, decorator, that's optional, right? Uh, uh, gen type does not come 
with a Reason project, it's something that you install additionally if you decide to use it, right? So if you don't use TypeScript or Flow, um, you know, there's less of an argument to, to use it, right? So um, this is optional right now. And then lastly, you got this let default equals make, right? So again, if I pull up uh, TSX, uh, greeting.tsx, you can see here uh, the differences are uh, similar but different. Uh, one thing you'll notice too is that there are no imports, right? Uh, JavaScript, you know, for good and for bad, has this thing called, you know, you know, you can do circular dependencies where you can import, uh, you know, greeting into uh, app, and then you can import app into greeting, right? That doesn't work, right? Uh, in Reason, right? And that's by design. Uh, circular dependencies aren't necessarily good; they make tree shaking hard, right? And just the common JS ecosystem. Uh, is a little tricky to work with, right? Like, you know, maybe you've seen uh, ESM and EJS, right? Like these different things. Like, the world is trying to push us into modules instead of common JS, right? Um, so there's that. There's no imports, right? You import every file. If I had a different reason component, let's see if I do here, right? So if I wanted to import modal into greeting, all I would have to do is, you know, write it like this. Right, and it'll it'll do it. It'll compile it. Oh, I have some error there. That's okay. But I removed it. Uh, compiled it in 62 milliseconds. Um, cool. Uh, so, what happens when you write a reason component and uh, export it to TypeScript? Right, we've we've seen what happens there. Right, but what if I want to import my JavaScript or TypeScript into Reason? Right, that's totally possible too. And the same way that you've probably done this with, uh, you know, definitely type, maybe you've seen that, right? It works the same way for, for uh, reason, right? So what you're doing is, you know, you're calling buckle script module anti tooltip, right? So in this case, it's just like, hey, we've got this module called anti tooltip, right? Or just let's just call it tooltip uh, js, you know, because we're used to. We've got this file called tooltip.js. Um, it happens to be a React component, right? So you add this here. And then what we have to do is we have to define the props for that, right? So we've got this arrow point at center, right? You know what a tooltip looks like. It's got, you know, this arrow, right? So does the arrow belong in the center always or does it go off to the sides, right? So that's, that's a Boolean, right? And it's optional, right? We've got this title and that's optional too, right? Uh, it takes a string. We've got React children, right? Uh, this is not optional, right? You don't see the equals. Uh, question marks that means that, that must be required and if you try to use this without placing children It'll freak out right if I decided to change this right and I went through my application somewhere uh, It would also freak out and say all these different places where this was optional must be required right and then lastly right because we do like export default tooltip uh, export default function tooltip or whatever right we know that it's going to be looking for the default and then I can just go into any of my reason files and import that uh, directly. Uh, cool. So how much time do I have? How long have I been going for here? Anybody? Got as much time as you want. How much more do you want to go? Oh, I don't know, like a couple minutes. I don't, ha I don't have that much, that much more to go. Sounds good. Cool. Okay. So uh, anyway, I'll show you some. So what what I have here is Draftbit, right? So let's see here. So uh, so I'm not running anything yet. So I'm going to do yarn start, right? Which you, oops, wrong file, right? And then I'm going to run yarn re watch, right? Actually, yes, run on a different port. Uh, that's going to start that up, right? Right. That's my compiler compiled, right? So you got that's pretty cool, right? So you've got uh, you know uh, create React app starting up, take take you know do whatever you need to do, and then you know the type of or the reason compiler is like, all right, 39 milliseconds, I'm done, right? So it's pretty radical what you're capable of doing, right? So so anyway, so we have uh, let's say we've got this component tree, right? Something that you're familiar with. Right. Uh, screen editor here. Sorry, if this is all too much on the screen, I'm I'm doing the best I can to keep it 
not crazy, but I know that it probably is super crazy, right? So I'm gonna close this for now, right? So before I do, so component tree on the right-hand side is a JavaScript file that we're importing into Reason on the left-hand side on line 51 right over here, right? So in this case, we are not supposed to pass in any arguments, right? As you can see on here on the left-hand side, we aren't, right? So as soon as I do, right, this freaks out and says, I'm gonna close this, not necessary. We found a bug for you, right? We know exactly where it is on line 51. Hey, hello, right? This function that you're applying to is a string, right? But this can't be applied with the argument, hey, right? So already it's telling us like, hey, you can't, you can't do this, right? Why are you doing this, right? So as soon as we remove it, it's gone, right? So I know this is a lot. Uh, GraphQL is another really, really cool thing, right? So in this case, we have a GraphQL query where we get the screen, right? So if you've used GraphQL before, you know this part is pretty familiar, right? You've got a screen query, takes an argument, view UID, which is an ID, and navigator, uh, which is an ID too, right? And you query that data. Well, the nice thing about Reason is it, is it uh, looks at our GraphQL server, right? And it generates a file that it could type check against. Right, so everything that we have in our GraphQL server, right, all the different types are aligned with our reason stuff too, right? So we've got the screen, and the screen consists of a UUID, right, as you see here, navigation config, which is a set of options that are optional, and then the navigator, which is also optional, right? And because of this, right, if we decide to change anything in this, right, it'll freak out, right? So let's say, you know, like, Let's say that, um, oh, this is so big. Oh. I know this is gonna be really hard. Okay, so I'm gonna find something, right? So let's say we've got this navigator type here, right? Uh, so right now there's only one thing and this was something that we wrote in Reason a long time before we knew what we were doing, right? So if we were rewriting this today, we would have something called a, uh, a variant, right? We would have stack here with a capital S, right? Um, instead of the, the string, right? And what a variant does is it allows us to um, define the result of anything to a variety of different things, right? So if I change this to stack right now, right? The compiler will freak out and say, nope, you can't do that, right? Stack can't be found, right? Uh, if I change this back, it all gets back to normal. Um, and see, one of the trickier parts of this is the reason why those variants are powerful is I just got rid of the word stack completely, right? This thing compiled, right? Because it doesn't do anything crazy about what's inside the string, right? It just does those things, um, you know, like it just knows that it must be a string, right? So if I went to this navigator type up here, right? And I said, what are the different navigator types? Right, so type stack, right? So if I went up here and I said, this must be a stack or a switch navigator, right? It's gotta be either stack or it's gotta be either switch. This will freak out. Oops, I broke something somewhere. Type navigator type is equal to a stack or a switch. I wish I was there so I could see this on the screen. Oh, this is the worst part about doing a Zoom presentation. I'll tell you that right now. I learned this the hard way. Uh, anyway, so we know that this type, right, is now a navigator type, right? So let's see. So where is it yelling at me? 22, right? So type navigator type, right? Where else, where else is it going to yell at me? Oh, unknown field on type navigator. I screwed something else up. Uh, anyway, so if we went down into where we use it, we can now safely update this to say stack, right? And not only are we getting rid of a whole class of bugs, right? Misspelling strings, right? Like adding extra spaces or whatever. We are now this building this into the language on its own and giving us safety and confidence that we didn't have uh, before. Uh, cool. Um, I think that'll be about it. My day cool is totally wearing off right now. I'm about to sneeze a whole bunch of times. So I think it's a great opportunity for questions, concerns. Um, if you do have questions and we, you know, we struggle to connect over this Zoom, you can always send me an email. 
uh, Peter at draftbit.com. Uh, I'll put that here. I should have put this here. Or you can tweet at me. I'm the, I'm the golden doodle on Twitter. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much. Super sorry about getting sick and not being able to be there. Uh, thanks to Bill and Lauren for still letting me do this. And maybe in a couple months, Bill will let me redo this when I'm healthy and it'll be way sicker than this was. But in any case, I really hope you all liked it. Uh, I guess it's time for some questions and answers. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, Peter. Uh, let's see if we have any questions. I'll give the mic to anyone. Searching. Yep, all right, here we go. Okay, um, cool. How pure do you usually write reason? Like, is it kind of like Haskell where you have an IO monad and all that? Or is it more like you're basically writing JavaScript and trying to minif uh, minimize your side effects as much as possible? Probably the, the, the latter, right? So our, our uh, reason, right? So this is, this is our actual uh, code base, right? That you're seeing here for, for uh, oops, properties panel. I'll, I'll show you what it looks like. So we try to write our uh, reason to be, to look like uh, JavaScript, right? So it's not, but like a lot of the components that we do, do, right? So I know Haskell take things, takes things to like a whole nother level, but you know, what you see here is uh, what you get, right? So uh, divs, right? Some of our functions, uh, you know, can be, can be a little different, but we try to avoid a lot of abstractions because, uh, you know, we've got a lot of newcomers. We're a small company, right? So if we decided to do things a more, you know, you know like functional, uh, monadic way, we'd get, we'd get a lot of questions up front, whereas uh, any new developer onboarding picks the stuff really, really quickly, you know, because it looks like something that they've seen before. D does that make sense? Yes. yes. Cool. We got any other questions? Anyone? I can come to you, bring you the mic. Anyone? Yep, here we go. If you had to interact with a third party library that relied on DOM interactions, would that be a limitation because you might have you know, a query selector by ID or something like that, that might return null or it might return HTML DOM item. Uh, is that a potential limitation of reason if you're not, if you're operating outside the normal React uh, methodology? So uh, React actually has the full DOM uh, and browser libraries completely typed, right? There's even a uh, BSJ query if you, if you need stuff like that, right? So, um, we we use that in some scenarios, right? So there are there are places. Let's see if I can think of one right now, right? Uh, you know, perhaps uh, would the URL be a good uh, example? You know, like so. Basically, sometimes you want to fetch uh, an ID from the URL, right? So you want to, you know, you've got like, uh, so you've got. Let's see here. So you know, you've got apps slash app ID screen slash screen ID, right? So I can't think of one right now, so I'm just gonna pick one here. So screen list picker, right? So uh, we're passing it down there. That's not what I'm looking for. So, oops, find TRE, app UUID, right? So let's see here. So app UUID, uh, somewhere over here. Okay, so, so, okay. So in this case, right, like this is like a, this is the best example of a DOM uh situation i can think of right but it would be a, it would work the exact same way right so you've got uh you need to get the app uuid from the url right so uh there's this thing called uh there's a standard library which is like lodash that's built into reason called belt right and belt's got this thing called uh get with default right so what this line is doing right here is if the app UUID exists, right, if it's there, right, return it. Otherwise, you know, like, because the app UUID must be a string, uh, you know, just return an empty string, and then we handle that somewhere down below, right? So, so there, there's one option, right? So now let me show you component type header. So a different way to handle that too, right? So you may say, but what about that event? That event does not exist, right? So, okay. So let's see, so I'm looking for, okay. So in this case, we're using Apollo GraphQL, right? 
And this is how I would apply, you know, if I'm looking for a DOM event, right? Like I said, everything that you can do in the browser, you can do in, in reason, right? So if I had, if I had to go get something, right? So what I do is I, I have this pattern matching, right? This switch statement here, right? Uh, in this case, it's, uh, we're getting back this object called data and then the component data might be null or it might have component there, right? So if nothing comes back in this case, seems like there's an error, right? Uh, so we just render something different, right? It's just like, we know in any situation, we're going to be returning a React component, right? So in this case, we're returning an error, but it's got an error boundary. But if that component exists, we know there's some component. We know there's something there, right? And this is a guarantee, right? So if we have some component there, we can go into c.definition.group and not have any issues, right? It's, it's something like, you know, TypeScript's existential operator, right? So something like this, right? So it does exactly that, right? But it's just guaranteed safety. Do, does that answer your question? Is that a good example? That's a good example, yeah. Cool, thank you. Any other, any other questions? Yep, yeah. As far as styling, um, I saw there's some like CSS and reason, like CSS and JS type ports for motion. Are you guys just, did you guys decide to use something like that or are you just using like vanilla CSS? So, uh, yeah, so we've gone through, you know, a couple versions of this, right? Just like in our own journey of figuring it out, right? So we used to just import CSS files, right? So, you know, I was a big believer of BEM, right? Block element modifier, and that's how we build things, right? Um, and then, uh, we, we switched over to emotion, right? So there are, uh, find TRE emotion, some places that we are using emotion, right? So it's, it's, uh, strongly typed, uh, CSS, right? So we've got in this case, some hover stuff going on here, right? Uh, I created this thing called global styles that, and I don't know if this is visible, really sorry if it's not, uh, but anyway, global styles includes some presets, right? Includes some things that we use very often, right? And it also includes things like, you know, font size and subtitle, right? Just a little design system, right? But when we want to write off one-off CSS, right? We can do just that, right? And the nice part about this is that, you know, we had some juniors on the team who would misspell the CSS a lot. And this sort of enforces you to uh, do that correctly, right? So cn.make here is sort of like class names, right? If you've used that class names library in uh, uh, JavaScript, it's something like, you know, like, I think it's, you know, like uh, this class. And then like the other side is like, if this is true or false, right? So this does the same thing, right? So in this case, all we're doing is joining class names together, right? But like uh, you take advantage of the language, right? And you can build stuff like this really, really nicely. Uh, moving forward though, we've had great success with Tailwind. So, um, so, so, and that just looks like normal uh, CSS. Let me find that here somewhere. I always forget, I guess I can search for, find TRE, uh, text mono. Right, so that just looks like this, right? So anything that you're used to, right, like exists, like BS styled components exist if you like styled components, BS emotion exists if you like emotion, right? You can do, uh, you know, you can do uh, J CSS and JS, right? Uh, so this is a normal class thing that you see here, right? Like this is all Tailwind, right? These are all automatically generated from our design system. Uh, but then there's also uh, strongly typed uh, react.mre.style.make, right? So a little different. It was a little confusing to me at first, but then background color is equal to, you know, whatever, right? And so you could totally do this. And that, that's the equivalent of, you know, background color E, right? So this is the CSS and JavaScript version right up here. Uh, and then this below is how you do it in a reason, except in reason it's, you know, it's strongly typed, right? So uh, you must do things a certain way. You must spell things correctly or it'll freak out on you, right? So if I, uh, you know, if I had them spell this, it would give me an error. Does that make sense? Is that a, is that a good answer? Yeah. Cool. Yes. Thank you. Yes. All right. 
Thank you, Peter. I think it's time for you to go get more medicine and rest up. Um, Bye, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>